There's probably no fairy tale more easily recognizable than Cinderella. I mean, I don't know if that's universal or anything, I'm just talking about that from an American perspective. So that automatically means my perspective is the right one, and all of this is wrong! <laughs> but yeah, Cinderella. Even the dumbest person on the street probably knows the basic details. Servant girl that talks to animals with an evil stepmother and stepsisters gets to go to a ball thanks to her fairy godmother, and meets a prince. But because the godmother's magic wears off at midnight, she hurries away, and the prince has to find her through a single clue, a left-behind glass slipper. Yeah, well, even if you don't know Cinderella somehow, you'd almost certainly know one of those tropes. But have you ever wondered why that's the case? And no, it's not because the Disney movie is just that good. <laughs> it's actually thanks to a little copyright law known as the public domain, where certain characters become open season to be adapted by anyone that wants to without copyright owners losing their shit. Otherwise known as something that existed alongside copyright until Disney hunted it to extinction. But the point is, Cinderella has been able to survive generation to generation because anyone can adapt it for better and in the case of this movie, probably for worse. It is kind of a necessity that comes with being in the public domain. Sometimes you get something like the 50s Disney movie, and other times you get stuff like A Cinderella Story and its five dozen sequels. Or in the case of today's video, a 2021 reimagining made exclusively for Amazon Prime with Camille Cabello. And you know, that's just amazing because I don't think a single one of the words I just said was positive in any way. I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. I hate this movie with every fiber of my being. Probably as much as or even more than some Disney live action remakes, which I wasn't sure it was even possible till now. And the reason for why I hate this film starts way before the main parts of it most people probably care about. No, my complaints start at its basic principle of deciding to be a JUKEBOX MUSICAL! Before I talk about how much I dislike that though, let me tell you about something else I hate about just as much. Keeping up my goddamn hygiene. Shaving anywhere other than my face has always been pretty difficult to do without hurting myself, since up to this point, I've just sort of been using a hair razor to do it. But those days are over for me thanks to this video's sponsor, Manscaped.com the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products, who sent me an entire care package of products that actually do as advertised. With Manscaped's new model of razor, the Lawnmower 4.0, I had none of the same problems I do with other razors, probably because of their skin safe technology and built in light to help me actually see what I was doing. Plus, it's chargeable and waterproof, so I don't gotta deal with a tough cord that limits how and where I can shave. And if that wasn't enough, for a limited time, you also get a carrying case and anti chafe briefs with a purchase, which, again, both work pretty well. So if this appeals to you and you'd prefer protecting yourself from cuts, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping and two free gifts when you use promo code STOP20 at checkout. Thanks for listening, and on to the video. So what is a jukebox musical, you say, as I strangle you for living a better life than I ever have? Basically, it's a musical, but few to none of the songs were originally written for the film. Instead, what these types of movies will usually do is they'll look at the iPhone playlist of an intern on set and decide to make that the basis for all their musical numbers. Yep, jukebox musicals pride themselves on the idea of using popular, current, or highly iconic songs to guide the movie's soundtrack. More often than not, pop songs, because any other genre would probably take, you know, a little bit more effort to get to work. And that's one of the reasons I hate jukebox musicals. The choices for songs are almost always way too predictable and bland. I mentioned how sometimes the musicals won't use current songs if they're iconic enough, but being realistic, that only happens maybe once or twice in a jukebox musical, if at all, unless the old music is all that's being used. A majority of the soundtrack is usually from the last five to ten years, and that's got its own reasons for why it is. First, it's marketable. How many movie trailers have you seen that use the fact that they're singing popular songs as as a way to draw on viewers. I'm pretty sure that was the entire purpose of Sing. It's trying to appeal to the younger generation, and whenever I hear it, all I can think about is the producers giving a fine how do you do to the fellow kids in the audience. What? Second, it gives the writers a chance to be lazy. Why create an iconic song with memorable lyrics directly connected to the plot if you can use an already popular song that's got a billion views on YouTube? <laughs> songwriting, at least good songwriting, takes time, and it takes talent, so when studios don't have either of those, licensed music is the way to go. But what these two strategies don't seem to take into account when putting Justin Timberlake's Can't Stop the Feeling into a movie about dancing trolls is that in the next five to ten years, no one's probably going to remember or give a shit about these songs. Sure, some will make their way to pop culture after all said and done, but for the most part, in the future, when people look back on these kinds of movies, they most likely aren't going to be compelled to watch it because of the songs alone, which more often than not date the movie for the sake of making it modern. Beyond that, I find it rather easy to tell when a song wasn't originally written 
written for a film. For one thing, the film, a majority of the time, doesn't even actually need the music. Unless there's a certain thematic element that singing brings which no other form of expression could convey, a film with excessive pop music just feels like a film that had them tacked on because the executives had no faith in the project based on the film's strengths as it was. The entire point of singing is that when words don't do enough to convey your emotions, you sing, and when singing doesn't do enough, you dance. Characters randomly belting into song out of nowhere doesn't work if the emotions weren't previously built up in the preceding scenes unless it's for comedy. And shocker, most jukebox musicals don't take advantage of the comedic aspect, at least not well. And it's not like there isn't good comedy that can be made from the situation. For instance, most jukebox musical songs hold no relevance to the plot since they're taken from completely separate scenarios, and if the song was originally written as its own separate thing, there's almost always a specific message and story it's trying to tell. For a jukebox musical to make this work, the crew has to either structure the film exactly as the song is, or they need to cut out most of the lyrics, leading to it feeling like something that could be interchangeably put in any movie. Wouldn't it be funny if a movie or play used this disadvantage to make fun of itself by maybe continually shifting the plot around because the song is different than what's going on in the actual story and the characters are like really confused by it or something? That could make for an entertaining sequence, but I've never seen that done because the jukebox musical industry is mostly built on the back of laziness and uncreativity that would rather lean into its flaws instead of making them strengths. That isn't to say that every jukebox musical is a failure from the start, however. Despite all I've said against them, there are a few I think work really well. A great example of using licensed music well to tell a story is Rocket Man, chronicling the life and times of pop musician Elton John. That's a bit too easy though, because that's a movie explicitly about the life of a real musician, so of course it would have the musician's songs play a large part in plot development and so on. If you want a movie that has both original songs and licensed music that I absolutely love, there's The Book of Life. I saw the movie when I was but a little ten year old, and at the time, having no idea who Radiohead or Mumford and Sons were, or what songs they made, I believed every song in that movie was wholly original. And I really think that's what most jukebox musicals should strive for. The way The Book of Life did this was not only by creating multiple fitting, original, memorable songs that sounded like they could pass as real hits on billboards, in a good way, but also by making the actual licensed music they used fitting for the film by changing the instrumentation and such. Adding heavy guitar and brass to fit with the mostly mariachi theme. And you know why they did that? Because the main character is a guy that wants to play in a fucking mariachi band. Yeah, a big comparison you could draw between my two main examples is that their protagonists are both musicians and therefore have a reason to sing, taking up a majority of the soundtrack on their own. Technically, you don't absolutely need a reason for the characters in your musical to sing on a meta level besides the basic principles I mentioned before, but actually giving a reason does add on significantly to the appeal and shows foresight in writing. Oh, and also, the movies I talked about both have qualities that make them good films beyond the song choices they had. A jukebox musical I can't stand is one that only has those musical elements for obvious appeal to the masses rather than to build on an already solid foundation with good characters, story, etc. Each song in the Book of Life advances the story and fits perfectly to the scene it's portraying. Rocket Man does this as well, though it can definitely lead a bit more into the figurative side. If you want to look at a movie that can't do this nearly as well, look no further than Nomeo and Juliet. And I know you probably haven't thought about this thing since the trailers for that terrible sequel that came out a few years back about, uh... Sherlock gnomes, but stay with me here. Gnomeo and Juliet is a retelling of the original Shakespearean story, but all the characters are garden gnomes and get into situations based on their setting. It's a perfectly average movie, but sharing equality with Rocket Man, this movie has multiple song sequences using Elton John music. And that's because Elton John was an executive producer on the movie and... No, that's it, Elton John was an executive producer on the movie, and that is the sole reason his music is here. I mean, does a sequence about the characters getting ready to meet up have to have Don't Go Breaking My Heart playing randomly in the background for no particular reason? No, but it's an iconic Elton John song that's vaguely about a relationship, and since he's a producer, the staff doesn't gotta pay, so why not include it? You can use the same logic for all the other songs they use. Crocodile Rock, Your Song, the only one that kind of works is Love Builds a Garden because it correlates well with the story, but that song was made for the movie, so overall, the sequences with already well-known Elton John music serve little purpose and were obviously mostly put there because they could. Sing is even worse in this regard, it's a producer's wet dream. The characters are holding a 
singing competition, so they can cram in as many licensed songs as they want until it's ready to burst. And while some do work better than others, it can't be denied that it would stand out so much more and probably connect so much better to the characters if at least some of the music was original, even just a little bit. Then there are films and musicals that seem to be tailored around the songs they use, like Mamma Mia, where the whole appeal is that it uses exclusively ABBA songs for its soundtrack. And I don't know how it is for the play, but at least in the movie, half of the songs had pretty much no connection to the story or characters, and were literally nothing more than ABBA song covers. And I think bits and pieces from all those examples fit into why I hate the pop music in Cinderella. I'm thoroughly convinced that every non-original song for this movie was picked based on the title and almost nothing else. Don't believe me? I'll go through every song I could recognize and tell you why it either doesn't work or could have worked much better. The first song of the movie is Rhythm Nation by Janet Jackson, which is a song about injustice and fighting against it together, but in this movie, it's just about how the townspeople follow a certain rhythm. So they can't have the verses, meaning it's only the chorus, making the song shallow for something that goes on for three full minutes. In conjunction with that song, Kamiya sings You Gotta Be by Desiree, that I guess kind of connects by being about trying to act strong, but it also mentions how love will save the day, and this version of Cinderella is clearly disinterested by love if it gets in the way of her pursuits, so why would she sing that specific lyric? The licensed song after that, Somebody to Love by Queen, is sung by the prince, and it completely undermines the character we've been shown of him up to that point. Like literally, the exact scene before that song had the prince say he wasn't looking for anybody and that he didn't expect to fall in love with anyone at this ball that his parents are holding. Somebody to Love is about asking why you can't get love despite working so hard for it. This song is the antithesis to what the prince was just shown as, and while you can make the argument that the working hard part is sarcastic with the musical sequence he's involved in, the part about desperately looking for someone to love is clearly genuine. It's probably the worst song you could have picked for him to sing at that time. Also, another sort of reimagining of Cinderella and other fairy tales, Ella Enchanted, beat this movie to it by like 17 years, so yeah, the moment has literally no merit at all. After that is Material Girl by Madonna, and it does pretty much nothing but stop the story for a few minutes too long to tell us that the stepmother values men that offer money. Something we got back near the beginning when she introduced an ugly guy with cash, so yeah, it could have been completely removed with nothing lost. Finally, after all those songs, they have Am I Wrong by Nico and Vince, which I will admit works a lot better than every other song here. It actually conveys something about the characters, and despite being a song sung by the whole cast, it connects in a way that makes sense. Too bad that's the only instance we're gonna be getting a proper writing from an already created song. Uh, What a Man by On Vogue is there doesn't really do anything besides exist as it's sung in a choir by the prince's suitors. Completely meaningless with characters that don't matter, I don't care. The prince and Camilla after that sing Perfect by Ed Sheeran, and I don't really care if it was a good placement or not. Perfect is one of the most boring, generic Ed Sheeran songs you could pick. I hate it in any context, and I'm already mad from the last several terrible implementations, so yeah, piss off, movie. The last licensed song of the film, Let's Get Loud, is basically the film's equivalent of the Shapoopy. It's a big musical number, so everyone can do the end of film DreamWorks dance off into the sunset, and the only good thing we got from it is a meme about James Corden bobbing his nuts up and down in a cheap mouse costume for an obvious stunt mob. I'm not even going to try to talk about the film's original songs because they're all far too forgettable to say anything about. But I think my point's been made that there's no substance behind any of the song choices, and everything surrounding the songs is just as bland. Just look at the choreography sets and clothes used for them. I don't know how it is for other people, but I think extravagant musical numbers need to put equal effort into the sets and movements of the characters, since that helps set the atmosphere and adds on to an already good performance. One of my favorite musicals is Les Miserables, the play, not the movie, and for shows like that you gotta pay respect to not only the music and acting, but the visuals. There are plenty of good plays that focus more on figurative action and body language rather than actual sets, but Les Mis has some of the best lighting, most authentic and nice looking costumes, coordinated and authentic choreography, and not to mention realistic moving sets incomparable to most others of its kind. The effort put into a production like that is easy to see, so please, please tell me why that live play that's performed on location is better at pretty much all the elements I listed than Cinderella? It's almost baffling. Every set is either noticeably small and withdrawn, or a big open field that doesn't make sense having nothing there other than for the dancers to perform. Since the sets are so lackluster a majority of the time, when there isn't a big crowd of dancers taking up a space, the singers have almost nothing to interact with for their numbers. During Material Girl, all the stepmother does is move between clothes in an open backyard and pretty much nothing else. When the fabulous godmother sings When You Wish Upon a Star in a pop cover, of course, all he's doing is sort of moving back and forth in his outfit 
outfit, not really even dancing or doing anything all that magical. Not that he could pull it off to begin with. Yeah, you're totally flying when you come down to Great Cinderella, totally not on an obvious wire. Wow, so magical, definitely didn't jump cut her out of that outfit like a fucking high schooler short film. You can feel how cheap the whole project is, and the costumes reflect that. Did these rapping minstrels get their attire from a Hot Topic stand for My Chemical Romance? In fact, did the crew find most of these costumes in a spirit Halloween or something? They all look so incredibly fake. Don't even get me started on Cinderella's dress. I don't know what it is about live action fairy tale movies and not being able to get the dress right, but it's an epidemic that needs to be taken care of this instant. First, there was Beauty and the Beast 2017, giving Belle a dress made of cheap curtains from your grandmother's house. And now, may I present Tissues the Dress. Is it so hard to look at references from the era these movies are supposed to be set in? Clearly it is in this film's case, since it can't seem to decide what time period it's going for and where. Half the characters have British accents, but the other half don't. There are scullery maids and everyone rides on horseback, indicating it's medieval Europe, but it's populated like New York City and they have buzz saws for some reason? Like, it's a small detail, but at the same time, it's a massive issue. Automatic buzz saws powered through small motors were invented a little after the days of fucking knights and world maps only shown on paper. I would have had control of all the territories right up to the domain of the sea monster. Well, perhaps you should marry the sea monster, right? Did... Do they just steal a joke from Pirates Band of Misfits? Yes! But unfortunately, there's this dirty great sea monster in the way. Huh. That's a thing, I guess. But anyway, yeah, pretty big oversight on the whole staff. Really shows you how much they cared about the continuity of this thing. And I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I do have to ask. Beyond the appeal of what popular songs might do to bring a few more people in, why is this a musical to begin with when they clearly don't give a single shit about the musical aspect? If you're asking me, I think it's so that they can have famous singers in big roles as an excuse for more promotion. And by God, I really don't like... An aspect you, the viewer, may have noticed while I was talking before is that I don't ever refer to the main character of Cinderella as Cinderella, and that's because I don't see Cinderella. I see Camilla Cabello being Camilla Cabello, and nothing more. For anyone who doesn't know who she is, Camilla is a pop singer known for her songs Havana and Bad Things, which are both songs I can probably assume you haven't thought about in years, and that's for good reason. As far as singers go, she doesn't have the biggest range or the most unique voice, being that type of performer that has one or two hits and then falls off the face of the earth with gradually less and less popular tracks. I mean, her most popular song is so old in internet time that it stars Lele Pons in the music video. Lele Pons! She just couldn't leave much of an impact because her style was so by the numbers and unremarkable, which leads me to believe she was cast in this movie specifically to boost her singing career. And I'll tell you this now, hearing her in Cinderella didn't really make me want to search out her other work. The film tries way too hard to give her big numbers she clearly can't fully handle, mostly showing on the highest notes where you can sometimes hear her voice break, and it is the most unpleasant thing to listen to. As far as acting, she's perfectly fine, nothing notable in her performance, but I don't like her as a singer, and I don't see her in the role of another character. She's playing Camilla Cabello, and nothing else. Not that she has the only lackluster performance either. Edina Menzel, who plays the stepmother, weirdly sounds terrible in almost every line she delivers. I don't know what it is exactly, might have something to do with how she sounds like a middle-aged Heather on half a bottle of Xanax, but her talking voice is almost unbearable to listen to. Ooh, and I can't forget about James Corden. Remember him? R remember that movie where he was the funny man that you laughed at? No? Yeah, me neither. I have no idea why James Corden keeps being put in movies, but we need to stop it. I think this is Hollywood's way of hurting itself, so somebody needs to get him away before they permanently make everything worse with his presence. If you were wondering what he played, James Corden and a few other comedians voiced the talking mice, but like, they do almost nothing but break up other scenes. I mean it when I say that they show up like once every 20 minutes to make a single comment before the story gets back in action. Probably because I didn't want to spend any more money on that sweet, sweet GameCube CG. <laughs> I suppose I should be counting my blessings that he's in this movie so little, but his character is only a little bit more annoying than all the other characters in this trash heap. Which leads me nicely into... Allow me to read you an excerpt from the description below the Amazon page that's supposed to give you a good idea of what the film's about and potentially get you hyped for it. <clears throat> Cinderella is a modern movie musical with a 
Boom! Take on the classic fairy tale. Our ambitious heroine has big dreams, and with the help of her fab godmother, she perseveres to make them come true. Having read that, if you were given that description without the name Cinderella, would you still be able to know what movie the description was talking about? Your answer should probably be no, because if you said yes, you're probably a big fat fucking liar. And for now, I want to focus on that bit at the beginning. Modern movie musical. For whatever reason nowadays, no one is content with doing a regular musical about a potentially original fairy tale, or even a retelling of an old one? No, now it's gotta have something to say about modern society and modern issues. Despite the fact that fairy tales in concept are meant to be timeless and relevant to all generations, not just the current one, of course you can include modern issues that can resonate with multiple generations if the writing potential is there and you're a competent creator, but no, the movie only comes off as unbearably modern in a preachy, unoriginal way that's been done a thousand times already. Before going a bit more into that, how about I talk about a good modern adaptation of a timeless tale, since it can be done well. The film I'm referring to is the 1996 movie Romeo Plus Juliet, which updates the setting and ideas used for the story, yet also brilliantly incorporates one of the most accurate line readings of the original Shakespeare play to this date. And yeah, the movie still has its problems, the whole thing is soaked in 90s cheese, but the writers clearly knew what they were doing, and did something no one else did to truly make an original experience. Switching the scene over to Cinderella, what does it think makes a modern musical unlike any that have been told before? Well, the characters randomly have moments of speaking with words like she cray i'm curious do you really need that cane no but chicks dig it this is gorgeous yes future queen yeah every day we stray further from god and other various catchphrases no one in real life actually uses, but those types of phrases have been being used more and more in movies over time, as much as we don't want them to. So what does Cinderella do to truly stand out among the crowd? We can't forget that there are dozens upon dozens of Cinderella stories that have been told over the decades, so how is Cinderella 2021 any better? Most of it comes down to two aspects. One, shit on the idea of a fairy tale. You know exactly what I mean. But uh, why does the magic have to wear off at midnight? I'm never gonna fall in love at first sight, that's stupid. <laughs> most animals cannot sing well, especially mice! And the worst part about all this shit is that the writers think they're being clever with their little comments, and I'm gonna tell you this right now, you're not fucking funny. Anyone can make these observations that a fairy tale doesn't have completely reasonable logic all the time. Every movie-going party has that one friend who can't stop saying obvious shit established for the universe of a film, like, but, but the sun in our world doesn't stay up for three days at a time! We know. Everyone knows. It's called suspension of disbelief. As in, I can't suspend my disbelief so much to think that you actually believe you're being clever here. A million small-time comedians better than you have bombed with that same set during open mic, so what makes you think you'll do better? Who could ever have thought that a fairy tale story wasn't 100% realistic? What a revelation! And these kinds of observations can be insightful if done in the right context to show that it breaks the pre-established lore, like I did with the modern buzzsaws example, but do you think the people writing Cinderella 2021 are that clever? It all reminds me of a bad robot chicken sketch, but these types of writers somehow never catch on. Can someone please sit one of these pretentious douchebags down and ask, Okay, asshole, so you hate fairy tale movies. If that's the case, why are you writing a fucking fairy tale movie? And that nicely brings me to the second bit about this movie that tries to quote unquote stand out among all other Cinderella movies. Back to the description, right after modern movie musical is the phrase bold take on the classic fairy tale. And what could that possibly mean? A bold take on a classic story? Hmm, I might be mistaken, but could it possibly be the same bold take that almost every Disney live action remake movie in the last decade has said when they mean it? The female heroine of a previous story has gone from the arm candy of some man to a strong, independent woman who opposes the patriarchy with her sheer empowerment. And you know, that was a bit of a revolutionary concept when Disney did it with uh, their princesses back in the 90s. Seriously, the idea of girl power is nowhere near a new concept in fiction, no matter how much Disney or whatever corporation says it is, including among retellings of classic stories, even before Disney. In fact, by this point, it's an even more tired and boring cliche than having a girl who gets saved by a guy or wants to be with one. That isn't to say that the basic idea of a woman being able to accomplish tasks on her own and forge a path that best fits her isn't admirable by itself, but to need good writers to make that a natural part of the character's personality 
personality and not their whole personality. What do we know about Cinderella in this movie? She likes to make dresses and wants to open a shop, but the men all scoff at her and the stepmom thinks she needs to smile more, so she needs to accomplish this shit all by herself. Then when she thinks of falling in love with the prince, to keep up with the theme of Cinderella being a strong, independent woman who don't need no powerful man to do stuff for her, the film has to come up with this dumb bit about Cinderella not being able to make dresses if she becomes queen because, quote, it would be frowned upon by court. But like, he's the prince that will become the king when he marries Cinderella. Last time I checked, the king controlled the fucking court. It's not like he's against Cinderella working or whatnot. All things considered, he's a pretty progressive prince, so why can't he change the law so Cinderella can live in luxury with the person she loves and still do the craft that makes her happy? And where is this standard of queens not being able to work in the Middle Ages coming from in the first place? Have you ever heard of Catherine the Great, Queen Victoria of England, Cleopatra, Nefertiti, Marie Antoinette? There are plenty of queens that did tons of shit for Europe Africa and Asia in the Middle Ages and beyond. Why would Cinderella not be able to work at all? From a historical perspective, considering where this film is supposed to be set and the logic around the prince being able to change whatever laws that might prevent her from working as king, it makes no sense that she wouldn't be able to do both. The film can't have that though, because apparently a woman who wants to be with a guy for his personality can't marry him if he's a prince, because that takes away her individuality or some shit. And while I'm on that topic, let's discuss for a while what this movie and many others are are trying to represent in making these bold retellings of classic stories. For a while now, there's been a theme of certain groups believing that Disney princesses are bad role models for kids because multiple of them marry into royalty or are saved by a man. But the thing is, none of these groups seem to watch the movies they're so harshly criticizing and believing to be so bad for the youth of today. In the titular Cinderella, she doesn't yearn for a guy or prince to sweep her away. All things considered, in the original film, she's pretty self-sufficient and free-thinking already, only wanting to go to the ball in town because she wants to go to the ball. Her encounter with the prince is completely coincidental, and she doesn't even know he's a prince when they fall in love. In the end, she marries him because she loves him, not because she loves that he's a prince. It's a story of perseverance and love transcending those types of boundaries between a peasant woman and a prince when they do so without knowing their social statuses. The movie didn't need to make it a constant point that Cinderella was empowered because it was implied and shown through the actions of the character in a way that didn't make up the entirety of who she was as a person. Even if among Disney princesses, she isn't the most memorable. These examples exist for other popular movies too. Looking at the first Disney princess, Snow White, she wasn't looking for a man. She was trying to escape the evil queen and fell under a spell by eating a poisoned apple. She was saved by True Love's kiss, and the guy happened to be a prince, but she wasn't actively seeking him out. Ariel wanted to see the upper world and met a prince by accident. Belle wanted to save her father and fell in love with the beast by knowing him as a person before knowing he was a cursed prince. Mulan wanted to save her father from war and ended up defeating the Huns, gaining great respect from the entirety of China. Plus, in the end, she got with a guy that was there to support her the entire way. The fact that these characters end up with princes or men doesn't take away from who they are as people. And in cases like Mulan, it's explicit that they've earned all they got through the endurance the characters exhibit, even in times for women that were less forgiving. What makes the difference in a movie like Mulan and a movie like Cinderella 2021 is that Mulan expands upon all of its characters and themes to stretch wider than simply girl empowerment, who also encompass acceptance, embracing someone for who they are, getting creative to win, and balancing the different sides of your personality. Mulan and several other Disney princesses are full characters with other developed side protagonists around to help propel the lead and themselves forward. Cinderella is set on pushing a specific narrative about female empowerment, one that can't encompass the main girl getting together with a prince under any circumstances, because that is not modern. So they have to force conflict to make it work and blatantly cast their characters with broad personality traits rather than developed ones to get their specific version of the message across. And when I say broad, I do mean broad. Almost every Every female character in this movie is all about empowerment and being powerful and strong, but other than that, they're pieces of wood. The queen has no personality to speak of, the stepmom is toned down from her film counterpart to be much less cruel and therefore much less notable, and there's also this princess in the mix whose only real purpose in the film is to pitch innovative ideas that are shot down by her father. Then at the end, since the prince has given up his princehood to be with Cinderella, the princess gets to become queen despite leaving no other impact whatsoever. This isn't restricted to female characters either, besides the prince, most male characters are misogynistic pigs that need to be taught a lesson. Like the king, who also has no personality beyond the trait made for pushing a specific message. You see where I'm getting at here? When you make a film around the messages you want to portray and not the characters or story, those aspects become second thoughts to get that theme across, leaving any complexity to be had to the wayside so you can preach about empowerment while giving people characters they're not going to remember long enough to be empowered by. The biggest icons for empowering people in entertainment are written in a way that doesn't make it seem like they're supposed to be the best things 
since sliced bread. The Breakfast Club has some of the greatest depictions of a generation we've ever seen, to the point that it still resonates with us now, but none of the five main characters were touted as role models and nothing more. They were presented with flaws, troubled pasts, interpersonal struggles, and that made them real. It endured us to them. They became icons for the themes movies like Cinderella try to push, and much more, by being down to earth and delivering their ideas through the dialogue and interactions of the characters. Instead of the story and other major aspects being nothing but a catalyst to the message of the movies like Cinderella, the themes are naturally exuded thanks to the great material provided to draw it from. So in the end, what is Cinderella 2021? Is it a garbage fire that needs to be burned? A pillar to corporate greed raking in the benefits of a market-tested idea? A bunch of actors that don't want to be there chewing the scenery? A failed phoned-in message about empowerment that dozens of movies did way better 30 years ago? An attempt of satire mostly played completely straight? A wannabe live-action Disney movie on a low budget? To all those things, Quite possibly. But what I hope for more than anything is that these movies will be forgotten. That it will only exist in video essays like this and slowly be lost to time with the other Cinderella movies that keep getting pushed out every year. Will that be the case? I can't say for now. But if you do remember this movie in five years, make sure it goes along the lines of this sentence. Wow. That sucked. I've been just up. See you later.